Thanks very much. Pain, what a horrible thing it is. When you have it, nothing else in the world matters. It doesn't matter that the stock market is crashing. It doesn't matter that the Canadians are dying. <laughs> Actually, that's not true. That matters. All right? When you have pain, you're totally focused on it. The only thing you can think about is stopping it. And the fact is that we will do absolutely anything to try to get away from that horrible feeling of, uh, of pain. <laughs> and there are certain modalities that work. Unfortunately, there are also many that do not. The textbook of pain has actually been written. And it would be really unethical to start any discussion on pain at McGill without mentioning uh, Dr. Melzack and his gate theory of pain. Dr. Melzack is known around the world uh, as perhaps the, the greatest expert in the transmission of, of pain. However, his gate theory, which is well known to experts in the field, I find pretty complicated. I don't really understand it, but I know that there are people who do understand it. I do know, however, what it refers to. I know that because of Melzack's gay theory, one can explain things like phantom pain, how it is that people who have missing limbs can still feel pain. I know that his gay theory also can explain why soldiers in battle don't feel the wounds until after the battle is over because the stress induces the formation of certain chemicals that we'll talk about that can alleviate pain. Pain, unfortunately, has been with us since time immemorial. Men and women have always experienced a certain degree of pain and have wondered what they can do about it. This ancient tablet goes back roughly 6,000 years to Sumeria. And you can see these medicine men carrying two herbs. One of them is the poppy, the other one is the root of the mandrake. And they undoubtedly use these for pain relief because the poppy, of course, contains opium. Before the bulb opens, the white exudate that comes out, the mixture of many, many compounds, contains morphine, one of the most powerful painkillers that exists, and of course, we still uh, use it today, though we use it, of course, in an isolated fashion. The uh, name morphine derives from the Greek god of dreams, Morpheus, and it's a very appropriate term because morphine can, in fact, put you to sleep, Unfortunately, it can even put you to sleep permanently. The therapeutic window of morphine is relatively narrow. So while it's a wonderful drug, it can cause a lot of problems. It perhaps typifies the double-edged sword concept better than any other medication. It has a Dr. Jekyll side and a Mr. Hyde side as well. And unfortunately, it has not been possible to completely separate the two. But as you'll see, we've made some inroads along those, uh, er in those areas. The ancient Egyptians also knew about the poppy. The Ebers papyrus, which dates back to 1550 BC, recommends the use of opium for colicky children. And indeed, it works for that. It will calm them right down. <laughs> that was a sensible therapy. Not everything that the Egyptians did was as sensible. For example, for headaches, they recommended the tying of a baby alligator on the top of the patient's head. Uh, I suspect that it works roughly as well as many of the therapies that you can buy in today's health food stores because the magic here, of course, is in the placebo effect. Hippocrates, the most famous of the ancient Greek physicians, suggested chewing on the bark of the willow tree. And that also had some scientific legitimacy because that contains a compound called salicylic acid, which can, in fact, alleviate pain and also reduce fever. So the ancients knew a fair bit about chemistry without really knowing any chemistry. And up to uh, roughly the um, uh, 15th century, the main pain relief was afforded by opium. And Paracelsus took the next great step. Paracelsus, you may have heard of. He was a physician, an alchemist, a physician. And uh, we know him for putting the foundations to, to the science of toxicology, which is doctrine that only the dose makes the poison. 
And that, of course, is the cornerstone of toxicology. But he also had something else to contribute to medicine, and that was his discovery that opium was soluble in alcohol, and laudanum was his invention, coming from the Latin term laudare, which means to praise, because indeed laudanum was praiseworthy. The active ingredient in it, morphine, was very easily absorbed by the body, and this became standard therapy. There were various versions of it called theriacs, and in those days, if you had any kind of medical problem, especially pain, you'd go to your local herbalist, and he'd put together some weeds and, and uh, leaves and bits of bark, and always put in some laudanum, because that at least did something. Uh, opium certainly made people feel better, even if it didn't completely take their pain away. In 1806, William Surtener, a German physician, was the first one to actually isolate from opium the active ingredient, which is, of course, morphine. And he was able to crystallize it as a nice white powder. Of course, he didn't know the chemical composition of it, certainly not the, the molecular structure. But it made therapy much easier, because now you could dissolve a known amount of morphine in alcohol and try to come up with some standardized dose standardized doses. But it was the invention of the hypodermic syringe that really pushed things forward. Because now you could bypass the digestive tract and you could inject it directly into the bloodstream. That was a very, very effective way to introduce morphine into the body. And it was a tremendous breakthrough in terms of pain relief. Unfortunately, it also made uh, addiction possible because it was so easy to inject that people started playing around with morphine and addiction essentially skyrocketed because mainlining morphine gives you a tremendous feeling of, uh, of euphoria. So again, we see the, the double-edged sword nature of this uh, medication. Surgery was very complicated. Um, Opium really wasn't very good for that because if you took enough opium in order to put you to sleep, chances were that you'd never wake up again. So in those days, surgery uh, was preceded by uh, alcohol. But let's face it, no matter how drunk you are, you tend to notice if someone is sawing your leg off. Uh, or they would sometimes knock you on the back of the head. That was anesthesia in those days, but again, it very often turned out to be lethal. So surgeons had to rely on their speed. They always had assistants standing by who would hold down the patient, and the best surgeons were the ones who could remove a limb in the shortest time. Robert Liston, one of the most famous British surgeons, prided himself on being able to amputate a leg in 37 seconds. That was quite impressive. Unfortunately, he also amputated the man's testicles at the same time uh, <laughs> because he was just wielding that knife so brazenly. But speed was the only way that they could reduce pain back in those days. And then along came some interesting discoveries that would make surgery much easier. Now, surgery was performed before any anesthesia. I mean, that's quite remarkable. In this uh, uh, picture, I think what we're seeing is the attempt to remove a kidney stone or some kind of urinary blockage without any anesthesia. It's hard to believe that the gentleman would be standing by in such a stoic fashion while this uh, uh, operation was being performed. However, all of this changed with the introduction of ether as an anesthetic. Perhaps the biggest breakthrough in the history of medicine because it made painless surgery possible and it had a very nice side effect. The patient actually woke up after the anesthesia had been uh, uh, applied. It begins with a fascinating story with a chemist, as of course anything that is of any worth in science begins with a chemist. Joseph Priestley, back in 1777, who is widely known as the discoverer of oxygen, wrongly known for that, uh, Lavoisier really deserves that credit, but anyway, Priestley did notice that when he heated up some ammonium nitrate, uh, he got very happy because it gave off a gas Nitrous oxide is the chemical name for it, but we know it better as laughing gas. And he noticed that when he inhaled this gas, he became all giddy, he became kind of euphoric. Uh, 
but he didn't really have any use for this gas. However, Humphrey Davy, around the year 1800, did. Davy noticed that when nitrous oxide was inhaled, it made him insensible to pain. That was a tremendous breakthrough. He documented his research on nitrous oxide, uh, writing down the effects, including the fact that it was available for pain relief, which of course at that time was a totally novel discovery. It led to something else. It led to laughing gas parties. People would inhale the laughing gas and get all high and enjoy it. So the same way that today students have pot parties, or so I'm told, uh, <laughs> in those days you had laughing gas parties. And it was perfectly above the board. You, you know, just inhale the gas and it would be fun. They still do this uh, today at some concerts. Uh, you'll see kids uh, going into concerts with balloons. Uh, this is not to celebrate the event. Uh, this is to inhale the nitrous oxide that they've put into the balloon during the uh, performance. Humphrey Davy had public lectures on chemistry, which were wildly popular. And in one of those, he actually synthesized nitrous oxide and asked a volunteer to come up on stage and inhale it. And as you can see, the, uh, the gas made a rather triumphant exit uh, from his uh, body through the rear portals, uh, undoubtedly to the delight of the gathering. So nitrous oxide became quite well known as uh, a substance, although it wasn't widely publicized as an anesthetic. It was more a gas that was to be used for fun. And when it came to fun, the cartoonists had a field day with this. This particular cartoon, uh, Laughing Gas, had a caption that could never be used today because our social mores have changed. And this was a remedy for <laughs> scolding wives. <laughs> There were theater performances based upon laughing gas, and uh, people would go up on the stage and inhale the gas and prance around again to the delight of the audience. And it was at one of those spectacles, just outside of Boston, that a dentist by the name of Horace Wells made a remarkable discovery. He went there with his friend, who went up on stage, paid his money to inhale the laughing gas, and was kind of dancing around, and fell off the stage and gashed his leg, but he climbed right back up, blood flowing out of his leg, totally oblivious of this. Well, Wells was sitting in the audience, not oblivious of this fact. Being a dentist, he was very sensitized to pain, because in those days, dentists, of course, had to deal with pain. They had no anesthetic, so if you had to have your tooth pulled, well, it was like pulling teeth. <laughs> <laughs> it was very painful. You had to be held down. So, of course, they were constantly looking for ways to reduce the effect of uh, dental work. So, he saw his friend fall off the stage and climb back up, not feeling any pain. He decided that maybe there was something to this laughing gas. So, he went and he purchased a pig bladder full of laughing gas from the guy who ran this little show. This was before polyester bottles, like the ones that you're getting. Uh, pig bladders were used in those days for containment of gases. So he took some of this and he went back to his office. He got his assistant to sit down in his dental chair, made him inhale the nitrous oxide, and proceeded to pull out a perfectly good tooth. <laughs> and the guy said nothing. So Wells knew that he was on to something. But in science, of course, you make an observation, you have to repeat it to make sure that, that you know, you're on the right track. So he decided to do this again. Uh, the assistant wasn't willing, uh, but he was a, you know, a good scientist and became his own guinea pig. He sat down in the chair and had his assistant pull out one of his teeth on nitrous oxide and he felt no pain. He put it into his practice and it worked. And then he thought that, gee, you know, this is just too good to keep for dentistry. Because in those days, surgeons, of course, had a big problem with pain. So he went down with his pig bladder full of nitrous oxide to Massachusetts General Hospital to speak to the chief surgeon, John Collins Warren, and tell him that he had something that could reduce pain. Warren was keen on this because they had nothing. So they set up a date. When Wells would come with a patient who needed a tooth pulled, 
and he would perform this in the operating room of, of uh, Mass General under nitrous oxide anesthesia. The appointment came, the patient sat down in the chair, an audience of doctors gathered, and he administered the nitrous oxide, proceeded to pull the tooth, at which point the patient screamed, got up, and ran out of the operating room. It turned out to be a total fiasco because Wells had not allowed enough time in his anxiousness to show how well this worked to let the nitrous oxide be absorbed properly into the bloodstream. He was hurried. Well, he was quickly hurried out of the theater too in disgrace, and in fact, a couple of years later, never having recovered, he committed suicide. However, luckily, he had a partner in his practice by the name of William Morton who knew that nitrous oxide worked because he had, of course, experienced this. But he also knew that there would be no chance of Warren allowing another demonstration of nitrous oxide after what had happened. But he thought, gee, you know, maybe there is some other chemical that can be used. And then he can go and say that he found something new and improved. Americans always like new and improved. But where was he going to get one? He went to his alma mater, which was Harvard University, and checked in with Professor Charles Jackson, his former chemistry professor, because he thought, gee, if anyone knows anything about putting people to sleep, it's a chemistry professor. <laughs> so he asked him, and Jackson said, you know, it's interesting that you ask, because we've noticed that whenever in the laboratory we open a bottle of this solvent we call ether, people get all droopy. And we've even kind of used it to have little parties inhaling this. Why don't you go and try ether? So he did. And he discovered that it was even better than nitrous oxide. It would put people to sleep very readily. Deep anesthesia, you could perform surgery. So he designed an inhaler, a very simple inhaler. It was a bottle with a sponge in it. The sponge would be saturated with ether with a little rubber hose would put into the patient's mouth. Down he went with this apparatus to Warren and he said, I have something new and improved. And of course, they were still desperate. So he agreed to a demonstration, but this time he would bring his own patient who had an external tumor on the neck that needed to be excised. The appointed day came, commemorated in this very famous picture that hangs in the Warren Museum at Harvard University in Boston, well worth seeing. And uh, the audience gathered, all physicians, and as you can see, this was before the days of antisepsis. They all got dressed up in their finest clothing to perform surgery in those days. And there is Warren, and you can see uh, Morton holding the inhaler. The patient has been put to sleep, and uh, the surgeon motioned to his helpers to stand by because he was sure that as soon as he cut into this tumor, the guy would start to wriggle and scream and they would have to hold him down like they usually did. Well, he took the scalpel, started his incision, and then he looked up at the audience and he said, gentlemen, because in those days only men were allowed into medical school, he said, gentlemen, this time, this is no humbug. And on that day, ether anesthesia was born. Unfortunately, there was no photographer present at that time, but they recreated the event the next day because they knew how important it was. And then they called the photographer, one of the earliest photographs ever taken, 1846. And you can see the real patient, uh, you see Morton and the surgeon standing uh, by. This room has also been commemorated. They in fact knew that this was such an important discovery that they put down their equipment, the scalpels and all the tools that they used on this table, and they left that and the chair exactly as it was. And so it is to this very day. You can go to Mass General. This room has been maintained. It is now called the Ether Dome. It's become a museum. They show you the wooden floor. They show you some spots on the, on the floor. They tell you that that was the blood from the original operation. Uh, it looks a little too red for that. But uh, they have all the original equipment. And you can go there and worship at that altar because this is where anesthesia, in fact, was born. Cartoonists, of course, love this kind of thing. And uh, ether as an anesthetic served multi-purposes. Uh, spanking children, of course, took on totally new dimensions if they were allowed to inhale ether. And pretty soon, it spread around the globe. 
within a year or so, people heard about it. Now, that was monumental in those days because, of course, this was before the Internet. So how did people find out? Believe it or not, it came from the mouth of Robert Houdin, the most famous magician of that era. Robert Houdin, you probably have not heard of, but you surely have heard of Eric Weiss. Eric Weiss liked Robert Houdin, indeed, to the extent that he stole his name and added an eye to it and became Harry Houdini, uh, the most famous magician who has ever lived, one of the most famous people who has ever lived. Uh, when you look at world rankings in terms of, of famousness, uh, he ranks anywhere from number four to six. And uh, number one is uh, usually Muhammad, number two is, is Jesus, uh, number three varies, sometimes it's Muhammad Ali, sometimes it's, it's Hitler. Uh, but the, the fact is that you can go to China and you go to some village and they won't know who the president of the U.S. is. Of course, you can go to some towns in the U.S. and they won't know who the president of the U.S. is. But, but they'll know who Houdini is. Uh, and Houdini became famous because of the name, really, that he stole from uh, Robert Houdin. Anyway, Robert Houdin, Robert Houdin had a full evening magic show of wonderful illusions, including one that he invented, which was the suspension. And I suspect many of you have seen this. There are many different versions of this. You normally ask for a volunteer in the audience. They come up and they lie down on a plank, which is supported, and you slowly take away all means of support, and you're left with just one support, and there's the person suspended in air. Well, Houdin used this illusion to promote ether. Magicians generally are very clever at weaving stories into their effects. So he came out on stage, and he told the story of how ether had just been discovered in Boston, and that he himself had found that not only could it put people to sleep, it could make them defy gravity, which of course was total bunk, but it catered to his illusion. So he would uh, take out a, a bottle of ether and use it to put the subject to sleep and then carry out the suspension. Now, in order to do this on a large scale, you need large equipment and large volunteers, usually women. I like to do th things on a small scale because I don't have to then carry around large equipment or large women. <laughs> I can do with small women. <laughs> Oops, unfortunately, she has had an equipment malfunction here. <laughs> Or what was the term that they use is uh, wardrobe malfunction, right. All right. So he would come out on stage with a bottle of ether and uh, wave it under her nose, and she would instantly fall asleep. And then she would be put down on a couch, something like this. And an orchestra would play. And as the orchestra played, he would use a cloth like this and cover her. So you could, of course, still see her shape. And as the music rose to a crescendo, so did she. Began to rise into the air. And he would, of course, show that there was no support anywhere of any kind. And she'd float back and forth. And as the music came to a climax, all of a sudden she would just disappear. That was a pretty good effect. And it, and that's how people heard about this illusion. It became very famous as le suspension éthérien. That's what people came to see. And that's how they heard about ether. And they knew that if ever this was proposed to them in a hospital to be put to sleep with ether, there was no need to worry. Because the worst thing that could happen is that they would float up off the operating room table. <laughs> well. <laughs> While this was going on on, on uh, this side of the pond, uh, or in, in Boston, Crawford Long in Georgia had already discovered ether. In fact, he had discovered this four years previously in 1842. But he was a lowly country doctor working in the backwoods of Georgia. And he had heard about ether parties that people were you know, holding elsewhere. And he had discovered that ether could also put people to sleep but he never published. It pays to publish. So he never got credit for this until much, much later. 
Today he does get credit. If you go to the U.S. Capitol, underneath the dome, there are statues to represent the favorite son of every state. Every state was asked to come up with a statue. Georgia came up with Crawford Long, and in fact, eventually, a U.S. postage stamp was also minted in his name because he really was the discoverer of ether. But of course, it's the person who publishes it first, and that was Morton who gets the credit. Although Jackson could also make a claim for the credit because he had suggested this. And the two actually battled over this. And Morton, uh, buried in Boston, died before Jackson. On his grave, it says, the inventor of anesthesia. And when Jackson happened to be in that cemetery and he saw that, legend has it he had a stroke. Whether or not it really happened at that moment, I don't know. It's one of these stories that is too good to check. Uh, but we do know that he did die of a stroke and that there was much controversy. On the other side of the pond, over in England, James Simpson came up with a different anesthetic. He also was experimenting with anything that could be inhaled. That's what they did in those days. But he was playing around with chloroform. And this became the anesthetic of choice in England. A very interesting anesthetic, recreation of the original experiment, where the patient would inhale the chloroform, go to sleep, and uh, surgery could be performed. And indeed, this was done well into the 1950s. Did I, I had my append uh, uh, tonsils out. I still have my appendix. I had my tonsils out in 1953 under chloroform. I remember this very well. Uh, the doctor took a piece of gauze, poured the chloroform on it, and then just clamped it over my mouth and asked me to count backwards from three. And I think I got to two. And the next thing I remember was that I was being given ice cream to eat because the tonsils were removed. Uh, chloroform is no longer used uh, because it's a highly toxic compound. It's a carcinogen, but luckily I used it before it was a carcinogen. <laughs> The, uh, the introduction of chloroform was not without controversy. The Church of England did not approve of this because Simpson had suggested the use of chloroform in childbirth. And the church maintained that women were to bring children forth in pain. That was Eve's punishment for tempting Adam with the fruit of the tree of knowledge, which of course was not an apple. People think it was an apple. Apples did not grow in that part of the world till the Middle Ages. We don't know what it was. Could have been a pomegranate. Certainly wasn't an apple. So anyway, uh, there was concern over this, but Simpson was very clever, and he fought back. He said, well, if you're going to play the religious game, let's go back to the Bible. How did God create Eve? He caused a great sleep to fall over Adam before he took out a rib. God was the world's first anesthetist, Simpson maintained, because he had put the patient to sleep. And that sold, especially when Queen Victoria gave birth to Prince Leopold under uh, chloroform anesthesia. If it was good enough for the queen, it was good enough for everyone, and it became very popular. Now, unfortunately, the only pain-relieving substance other than surgical anesthesia in those days was still only willow bark and opiates. Opiates were widely sold usually with beautiful bottles, markings like this. This instant pain annihilator contained opium with a good dose of alcohol. So you certainly felt good after you, you, you took it. Uh, unfortunately, it also led to a lot of addiction, which was a big problem already by Queen Victoria's uh, time. Uh, opium dens uh, were everywhere, including in, in, in England. So once again, we see the double-edged sword nature of this, uh, of this chemical. Felix Hoffman then came along, working for the German pharmaceutical company Bayer. Well, turns out that he had a father who had all kinds of arthritic pains. And in those days, for arthritis, the only remedy was willow bark extract. That was the time-honored Hippocratic remedy. The trouble with willow bark extract, though, is that it is very irritating to the stomach. Incidentally, the willow that we're talking about here is not the white willow, not the weeping willow. Uh, it's the, uh, it is the white willow, not the weeping willow. And the white willow looks quite different. And the bark of this uh, tree contains a compound called salicin, uh, 
which upon ingestion breaks down to produce salicylic acid. So in those days, if you had arthritic pain, you were in fact asked to chew on the bark of the willow tree. But when you did that, you also took the chance of an upset stomach because salicylic acid is notorious for causing gastric bleeds and gastric problems. And Felix Hoffman's father suffered from this. Hoffman wanted to find a solution. So he went into the laboratory. He thought, gee, maybe if we could modify the structure of the salicylic acid molecule somehow, we might be able to retain the therapeutic properties and take away the nasty properties. He looked through the scientific literature, and he saw that someone already had converted salicylic acid into something called acetyl salicylic acid, but had never tried that as a drug. He decided to do that, to try it, and he kept copious notes, and there's the first ever written description of the use of what eventually came to be known as, as aspirin. He introduced this through a very simple chemical reaction, taking salicylic acid, converting it into acetyl salicylic acid, or ASA, as we know it. It became very popular. Aspirin was the trade name, taken from the Latin a, meaning from, spirin willow. Not that aspirin comes from the willow tree, it's a synthetic material, as you saw, but the idea came from the willow tree, and the raw material, salicylic acid, came from the willow tree. Aspirin was very successful because, indeed, it was far less irritating to the stomach than salicylic acid was. And it's curious that today you can go into a health food store and see salicylic acid as a natural substance, as an alternative to the synthetic drug aspirin. <laughs> it is remarkable how they go backwards in time with this illusion that something that is natural is automatically better. Salicylic acid is not better than aspirin. Aspirin was developed because of the notorious side effects of salicylic acid. But of course, in the world of health foods, that doesn't matter. The only thing that matters is the bottom line. And they're very, very successful at selling nonsense for high prices. So aspirin became very, very successful as, as a remedy. And uh, the name today is widely known around the world. It no longer belongs only to the buyer company. Anyone can sell it as aspirin, or indeed, generically, as ASA, acetyl salicylic acid. And since then, we've learned that not only does it reduce fever and pain, but it also has an anti-inflammatory effect. And indeed, it has an anticoagulant effect, which is the reason that it is so often given prophylactically to people who have already had one heart attack to reduce the chance of a second one. It is a remarkable drug, and recently we have learned that it is also a preventative for colon cancer. That is, patients who have arthritis, who take a lot of aspirin, are far less prone to colon cancer, but nobody is yet at a stage where you recommend that healthy people take aspirin prophylactically, but that's not an impossible thing that that recommendation is going to come because the evidence indeed is very strong. Well, if you had more severe pain than just ordinary arthritic pain, you were still stuck with morphine. But Hoffman thought to himself, gee, you know, if acetylation of salicylic acid made it an improved drug, what about taking morphine, which also has an OH group on it, as you can see, which can react with acetic acid? And he converted morphine into a novel substance that he thought would perform heroically and called it heroin. So heroin is basically morphine with a slight chemical change to it. And the hope was that just as he had been able to improve salicylic acid, he'd be able to improve morphine and separate the good qualities from the less good ones. It didn't turn out like that. Um, interestingly enough, heroin, which was at first promoted as a sedative for coughs, for which it works extremely well, but no longer is prescribed for that, it was on the same billboard as aspirin. Because both of them, of course, came from Bayer, and they both came from the hands of uh, Felix Hoffman. But as the potential of heroin to cause addiction surfaced, that was removed from the market, and aspirin, of course, is still with us today. But the idea that you can improve morphine, of course, was a very good idea. The question was, how do you do this? Modification of the structure can be done in many different ways. Acetylation to heroin didn't work. 
However, oxycodone was a derivative of morphine that did work. Well, what does that mean, a derivative of a molecule? I don't want to scare you too much with these molecular structures, and of course, it's not important that you understand all of the nuances. You just have to understand that this is the chemist's way of portraying a molecule. And any chemist anywhere in the world, no matter what language they speak, will look at that molecule and know that it represents morphine. Well, when we say a chemical modification, generally we mean carrying out chemical reactions that changes the basic structure. Oxycodone is such a modification. It's not a very big modification. If you take a look at these two drawings, you see that they only differ in two places. And uh, we call this an analog. So oxycodone is an analog of morphine. The hope was that it would be less addictive while still maintaining the painkilling effects. And it turned out to be more or less an improvement on, uh, on morphine, although not as dramatic as, as one would have liked to see. Oxycontin that you've heard so much about is in fact oxycodone, but it is in a time-released preparation. Uh, Oxycontin in Canada now has just recently been taken off the market, the reason being that, that uh, addicts were cutting the pills apart and crushing them and extracting the drug for abuse. So now Oxycontin is being replaced by something called Oxineo, and uh, this is a different kind of a capsule that cannot easily be cut open and the drug cannot be extracted, but you still have the same active ingredient. So there's a slight improvement on, on morphine. And then along came uh, hydromorphone, uh, known commercially as Dilaudid, and an interesting name because it plays upon laudanum, which was the original name that Paracelsus gave to his uh, morphine in alcohol solution. And hydromorphone was um, also a very effective painkiller. It was a very good antitussive. It is still recommended for, for coughs. Uh, however, it still had the addictive uh, potential. And once again, you see that Basically, it was a chemical modification. The basic structure is the same, but there are some slight differences, very slight differences. And this is what chemists normally do, pharmacological chemists, is they play around with the structure to see whether or not small change can lead to a big improvement. By 1932, Demerol had come on the scene, and although I show you the structure there, at first hand, it doesn't look like it's a morphine analog, but in three dimensions, it really is. Um, it's not a very close analog, but it seems to fit into the same receptor sites in, in, the, uh, in the brain and spinal cord as morphine does. Demerol is widely used in hospitals. It, the hope was that it would be non-addictive. It turned out that that's not the case. Uh, but uh, it very often is used instead of morphine because it does have uh, uh, a different um, side effect profile, although it depends very much on the hospital. Uh, you know, different hospitals have different ways of working with drugs. In some places, they, they don't use Demerol at all. In some places, it's the number one uh, drug. By 1953, a competitor for aspirin had appeared, and that was acetaminophen. Uh, acetaminophen uh, has um, overtaken aspirin in total sales for, for pain, for over-the-counter pain, because indeed it is very effective but it does not uh, do anything for inflammation. So for arthritis, it doesn't cause the swelling to go down, although it will administer to the pain. This uh, was quickly followed historically by uh, Vicodin. Vicodin is um, uh, basically a hydroxycodone with acetaminophen. And by this time, they were thinking that maybe combinations of these painkillers would work better than the individual ones. The truth is that it's not clear that that is the case. Uh, sort of is you know, said to be the case, but I can't really find any controlled studies that show that the combination of hydrocodone with acetaminophen is actually better than hydrocodone. But you may be familiar with Vicodin because uh, this is what Dr. House is uh, addicted to, and this is what they talk about in the show all the time. Percocet is also one of these combination drugs. This time it's oxycodone together with acetaminophen. And again, there's varying opinion on whether or not that combination is better. Anything that contains an opiate, whether it's hydromorphone, oxycodone, or any of these, is still addictive. I mean, we're still searching for that holy grail. By the 1970s, a non-steroidal anti-inflammatory that took the world by storm appeared in stores, and that was ibuprofen. 
Uh, you know it also as, as Advil. And this will reduce inflammation. It does take away pain, but it still is saddled with the problem of gastric issues, just like aspirin. But it is a very, very widely sold drug with a very good uh, pain relief uh, profile. The next breakthrough came right here in this building. Bernard Bellot, uh, who was a chemistry professor here, came up with uh, a drug called Statol, which was 5% more potent or five times more potent than uh, morphine, and it had fewer side effects. It was expensive, uh, but it is used when, uh, when necessary. Uh, it is sort of one step above morphine. I mean, for most people, morphine will work well enough, but if it doesn't, then you go to uh, Statol. So there are a number of morphine analogs that are available today. One of the famous ones that you may have heard about is fentanyl. Fentanyl also is a molecule that is similar to the morphine structure, and once more, the hope was to get rid of the addictive potential. Now, I don't want to make too much of the chemical structures here, but the fact is that fentanyl looks very much like morphine. It fits onto receptor sites. And then when you establish that, well, you again try to modify this. Perhaps by putting on a CH3 grouping, we call that a methyl group, and you create something called alpha-methyl fentanyl. Alpha-methyl fentanyl is even more potent than fentanyl. Unfortunately, it is even more prone to abuse. And it is uh, a drug that is widely sold on the street. However, the real problem with fentanyl lies not with alpha-methyl fentanyl, but with something we call 3-methyl fentanyl, which was first synthesized by some sort of clandestine chemist trying to get a drug on the market that would be beyond the law, because if something doesn't exist, you can't have a law against it. And the hope was that you could sell this on the street, make lots of money, with this new version of heroin, as he would call it. Well, 3-methylfentanyl is a very interesting uh, substance. It supposedly was the um, sleeping gas used by the Russians in the terrorist attack that took place on the theater in Moscow in 2000, when uh, a number of terrorists took over a performance and took 850 hostages. They were Chechen uh, rebels, and uh, they wanted Russia to leave Chechnya, or they said they would kill the hostages. Well, the Russians are not, the Russian government is not one that's going to be uh, blackmailed. So they decided that they were going to attempt a rescue. And what they decided to do was to pump what they said was a sleeping gas into the theater that would hopefully put everyone to sleep, and then they would go in and rescue the hostages and uh, capture the criminals. Well, it didn't turn out like that. They did pump something into the theater, but it wasn't any sort of a sleeping gas because the people in there perished, not all of them. Most of the terrorists died because of the exposure to this gas, and uh, I think 179 of the hostages, unfortunately, also died. The theory is, although we don't know for sure because the Russians, of course, are very secretive about these things, uh, the theory is that it was 3-methylfentanyl that they had pumped in there because they thought that it had a good chance of knocking everyone out. Well, nothing like that had ever been attempted before. It isn't a sleeping gas. No such thing really exists except in the movies. Uh, and this had a, a pretty tragic uh, outcome. And, uh, uh, over 200 people eventually died uh, because of this. But that really is what brought 3-methylfentanyl its, uh, its fame. The reason that uh, we think that it was 3-methylfentanyl uh, is that the doctors uh, at the scene were told by Russian officials to administer naltrexone to the victims. Naltrexone is a drug that blocks the effects of opiates. Once more, it is very similar in structure to morphine. But this time, it's the wrong key that fits the receptor site. So it doesn't activate the receptor, but it is still in the lock, so it prevents the right molecule from fitting in. And naloxone or naltrexone is commonly used these days to treat opium overdose or morphine overdose. And that's probably you know, pretty good evidence 
as to the fact that it was 3-methylfentanyl that was used in that attempted uh, rescue that went astray. Well, unfortunately, drugs like this, 3-methylfentanyl, can be cooked up quite easily in uh, underground labs. You don't have to have very much chemical knowledge. An undergraduate degree in chemistry and access to the internet is enough to be able to cook up some pretty, pretty dangerous substances, including 3-methylfentanyl. And this has happened. A clandestine chemists have done this with very, very primitive equipment. I actually use more sophisticated equipment than that, but uh, it, 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 it could be done uh, with, with this. And it's a very, very profitable undertaking because if you can manufacture 200 grams of 3-methylfentanyl, which is not a whole lot, it's about a handful, that translates to about 200 million doses. That has a fair value on the street. If you want to make heroin, you need to start with morphine. If you invest $2,000 in morphine, you can make about a million dollars by converting it into heroin. I mean, still not a bad profit. But if you start with fentanyl and you methylate it to make 3-methylfentanyl, you can turn $2,000 into $1 billion. And the chemistry is not very hard. The hardest part is to get your hands on some fentanyl. And this is why it is so carefully guarded in hospitals. But it can be stolen. Unfortunately, sometimes it's the physicians themselves who do this. Uh, anesthetists have been known to do that. They will remove some fentanyl from the bottle, replace it with some water, and sell it. This is dastardly for several reasons. One, of course, it's a crime. The other reason is that the bottle now contains actually less fentanyl than it should. So the patient who is going to get that is going to suffer the, uh, the consequences. So this is a big problem, uh, the whole street drug business. The stuff is often sold as so-called China white or new improved heroin. Unfortunately, 3-methylfentanyl is far more potent than heroin. So heroin addicts who were used to mainlining a certain dose of heroin would overdose by taking the same amount of 3-methylfentanyl and die. And it still happens. People die on the street from using the wrong kind of, uh, of drug. It's our biggest social uh, problem. But finally, we have to answer the question of why is it that these opiates offer pain relief? I mean, isn't that strange that the juice that exudes from a poppy that grows in the Orient should take away pain? Why should that be? Good luck is why that is. Because that molecule in that white latex, morphine, happens to chemically resemble molecules that we actually synthesize in the brain. These are the endorphins that have received such wide publicity, the body's own natural pain relievers. This is why soldiers in battle don't feel their wounds until after the stress of the battle is over because their brain synthesizes endorphins. These are the body's natural painkillers. Morphine happens to fit into the same receptor sites as the endorphins. It's a chance thing, but it's good luck for us. Runner's high comes about the same way. When you run a lot, when you exercise a lot, you do generate endorphins, and you get this feeling of euphoria. It also is responsible <laughs> for the effects of acupuncture. Acupuncture has been with us since the days of the ancient Chinese. The idea, of course, is that if you stick needles into certain meridians in the body, which are energy channels that they describe, that these needles will unlock the energy and restore you to good health. Needless to say, there's no anatomical equivalent of these energy channels. Uh, this comes from 3,000 years ago when they knew nothing about anatomy. But there's no doubt that for some conditions, people will tell you that they get the needle stuck into them and they feel better after. And of course, if you look at acupuncture, they will tell you that there are specific points where these needles have to be stuck. Well, acupuncture has been studied. The literature on this is vast. Acupuncture can be studied, interestingly, in a way whereby you use sham needles. The needles are actually in this uh, 
little device, and the needle, it retracts into the device. So you put this on the patient's skin, and it feels as if the needle is actually going in, but it actually retracts to see whether or not it has the same effect. And the studies show that it does. Studies also show that the effect can be countered by injecting naloxone, which blocks opiates and also blocks endorphins. So another point in favor of, uh, of endorphins. The, uh, the jury is kind of out on acupuncture and what it works for and what it doesn't. But I think uh, most experts will say that uh, whatever it works for are the kind of things that placebo effects work for. You have other things out there like the zero point energy wand, that totally quack device, sells for $300 with all kinds of interesting verbiage about how it reduces your zero point energy, which is nonsense. Uh, but people will tell you 30% of the time that their pain goes away. That's the statistic that we attach to the placebo effect. Anton Mesmer, back in the 1700s, used to take pain away by having people hold magnetized rods that the magnet would suck the pain out of their body. Thus was born mesmerism. Well, this basically was an example of the placebo effect. And that placebo effect is one of the most important effects that exists in medicine. In fact, many of our prescription medications have a good placebo component to them. The physicians themselves have a good placebo component. In fact, when you have some kind of problem and the physician comes in and puts their hand on you and says, you're going to be okay, you already start feeling much, much better. So that kind of bedside manner is a tremendous contributor to the placebo effect. And you can also show, interestingly enough, that the placebo effect works even when the patient is told that it's a placebo effect. You can tell the patient, look, I don't have anything to give you, but I'm going to give you a placebo. A placebo is just a sugar pill. There's no active ingredient in it, but 30 to 40% of the time, it works. We don't know why, but it works. Let me give it to you. And believe it or not, it works. Why? Because the patients usually think that you're carrying out some experiment and that it actually does have an active ingredient, and you're trying to tell them that it doesn't to see whether that works. <laughs> So it doesn't matter how or why it works, the important thing that it works, and it comes with minimal side effects. Not total side effect free, because if you think that it does have side effects, it can. That's the nocebo effect. And we see this all the time. We see people who believe that they will get a headache from drinking artificially sweetened drinks with aspartame, they will get a headache. And it's enough to tell them that it's, su it's sweetened with aspartame when it isn't, and they will still get the headache. That's the nocebo effect. The body is a fascinating and a very complex machine. Well, I think you've learned a little bit here about pain and about the new developments that uh, uh, we have introduced so that we no longer have to take uh, sort of uh, primitive uh, measures. And I want to leave you with uh, a couple of observations. I told you that I didn't quite understand Melzack's gay theory. However, I do remember sitting in his class uh, a long time ago. This, this would have been uh, 1970 uh, in his psychology class when he was talking about pain. And he did a demonstration in class. It's the only demonstration I remember. And he said, look, if you have a toothache, all you have to do is spread your fingers like that, your hand like that, and take an ice cube and apply it there, and the pain will go away. And lo and behold, next time I had a toothache, I did try that. And I'm too old to remember if the pain went away. <laughs> but I, I seem to remember that it did. Uh, and of course, if you believe that it will, uh, it probably will. Although I've also been told that there actually has been some scientific research on this and that uh, the, one of the nerves that you're stimulating there does somehow connect uh, to, uh, to the brain and does trigger the release of endorphins. So Melzack deserves some contribution for that, and it's pretty cheap. You can try it the next time that you have a toothache. In fact, you can try it for any pain, because there's no reason that this should be specific for uh, dental pain. It should really work for uh, anything uh, at all. 
And uh, who knows when the next uh, little miracle will come out on the street and maybe the endorphin pills uh, will be marketed. And I suspect that they will work about 30 to 40% of the time, uh, just like any other placebo. So I hope that you've had a little bit of insight here into what this fascinating area of pain is. And uh, over the next six weeks, of course, you will get uh, much more specific information as each of the speakers will deal with their uh, area of pain. But uh, certainly, if you have any questions at all that you want to, to pose, uh, this is your chance. Uh, although, of course, they have to be uh, questions that are in sort of a general uh, format. Uh, not uh, in terms of I have this pain here and what is the best drug to take. Uh, those kind of uh, uh, questions should be addressed elsewhere. After all, that is why God created physicians.